with the, with the turmoil around um, how kids are being taught these days, um, the very idea of how his thought is quite contentious. So to be asked to talk about inquiry, like I put gloves on, it's like, oh, let's go, let's go. I mean, if we get there, I've got a poem for the end called Critical Rage Theory that I will share with you, but I don't wanna start off on that note. Um, uh, I translated, I was thinking of all the ways that queries and inquiries in my life. I translated a Cuban poet, Caridad Atencio, who has one of my favorite lines ever, um, which in English is, for what have you lived your life? Your curious life, if not to tell it, the poet's task is to testify. And I've been trying to write history, tell a big story through a little story, because nobody, you know, if you say, let's talk about World War I, it's like, oh, maybe next week, not now, you know, but if I tell you about this bullet I found in my grandmother's sewing basket and why she had it, then I've got your attention. All these carry stories and feelings in them, like a crumpled up letter thrown in a waste basket, a, a weird umbrella, the bullet in the sewing basket. Um, so the other ways that inquiry in my life, in my poetry book, I mean, my poetry group, sorry, we have another chat book. Our first one was called, get ready for this wonderful title, Myth America. And it's all, we, for a few months, we weekly wrote a collaborative poem on how to some practice of reviewing monthly queries. Each month has a different set of queries, how to live a good life. Um, the nuns that taught me in high school, these progressive nuns were insistent that if you don't challenge your faith, even point out it, that uh, unchal an un unexamined, unquestioned faith is a weak faith. Um, so let's hear it from the nuns. Um, what was the other one? Oh, feminism. If you ask a different question, you're going to get a different answer. So that changes the mode of inquiry right there. And then the last one is, is Plato's. Um, dictum that the unexamined life is not worth living. So questions, 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 and clearly it gets people really nervous and worried, which is a great sign. So voila, <laughs> let's go. How, how did you all pick that? I mean, last time, last year was The Refuge of Witness. The first series was Poetry, the Best Medicine. So how did you pick this one? Yeah, I think I think part of it is the, you know, Mary Oliver's The Journey. You know, you woke up and you knew what you had to do and David White sometimes, you know, they've just been poems that the question is just like a gong has gone off. You're like, what's the question in David White? What's the question that won't go away? Every time I read that, I become very quiet and ask myself, mm -hmm. what am I not? What am I pretending not to know? What don't I want to ask myself? So part of it is I just felt like these questions they become volcanic. They just kind of like spring out. And I just felt like you know, last year was kind of, uh, you know, the first year was kind of huddling down during COVID. The second year was, hey, we're still seeking refuge, but we're witnessing. And this year is, let's ask the big question. Let's have poems ask the big question. What are we really going to do now? And I asked myself, of course, I'm sitting here in my, my little bat cave downstairs in my house in Maine, but I am thinking the same thing. You know, what am I going to, you know, support? What am I going to? Hmm. work with who am I gonna you know just I felt like the question just it's you know for me it's like an internal prompt that just gets this 
engagement going for me. So that's how it started, long, long explanation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say that the questions that continue to plague me and interest me are questions that rose early as a young adult, as a teenager, um, that, that really contentious generational divide of, are we gonna follow in our parents' footsteps or are we gonna try to do something different? Um, and as a, I left the country during the Vietnam War um, and I live out all the repercussions of that to this day. Um, so when you asked about the questions, I would say the ones I'm always looking at is why, why would someone make that move? Why yeah. would you like, I mean, immigrants also are our grandparents. Why would you leave your country and come to another country? What's the push? What's the pull? What's the advantage? What's the price? Um, why venture out? Why not? Um, what is gained by leaving? What is lost? And can you ever go home again? Um, and what are the pushes and pulls for the immigrant, the dreamer, the exile, the banished? So other than that, no questions, there's endless series of choices that we make at different times in our life that continue to echo. Hey, Bill. Um, so can I read you a question? Oh, you? absolutely. Sure, absolutely. Well, this is a manic poem. My dad, this is my dad early in the morning. Um, you know, this is a person I ate breakfast cereal with for 18 years of my life. So it really rubbed off on me. Um, my dad was pretty manic about the questions and my mother was pretty cool. Um, and since I am an early riser, I would share that early morning questioning of his. Uh, the title of the poem, and today I'm moving like from old poems to new poems. So this is um, an older poem. Kicks. He needs to speculate, to provoke, and spar like most people need to breathe. Barely dawn and my old man is ready to roll. How high is the river today, Hal? 28 feet, 30? The question is a mere launch into quickening currents of desire. What did Mitch pay for that station wagon? Does your mother smoke in the basement? Do you think there are more Jesuits in colonial Canada or Mexico? What wiped out the settlement in Cahokia? Listen, if a gorgeous dame walks, sits next to you in a bar in Rome, do you buy her a drink? How many comics do you kids read in a week? How old will you be when I die? 30, 50? Come on, make a guess, just for this kicks. Anyway, that's my dad. That's my dad. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, another one that might set up how we think about this going forward is a translation I did of a poem by the Chilean poet um, Jorge Tellier. And, you know, you're talking about the eternal questions. And his poem is trying to figure out how to talk to the dead, which we probably all need to do. So here's the translation. To talk with the dead. To talk with the dead, you must choose words they'd recognize as easily as their hands recognize their dog's coat in the dark. Words calm and clear as the torrent tamed in the cup or the chairs the mother puts back after the guests have gone. Words that the night might welcome like the marsh welcomes a will-o'-the-wisp. To talk with the dead, you must know how to wait. They are timid, like a child's first steps. But if you're patient, one day they will reply. With a poplar leaf caught in a broken mirror, a flame suddenly revived in the hearth. The dark return of birds passing a girl who waits, gazing and still in the doorway. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Yeah. I think he died 
in the early 70s. Do you, do you know that, Alina? Does that sound about right? Okay, all right. No, so, it's great, great, fantastic. Yeah. Um, should I keep going? Yeah. Okay. This is your, yeah, you got to keep going. Uh, if your dad's rolling, you got to roll. All so. right, well, this might calm things down a little bit. This is my grandma, um, my mother's mother, where she gets her pool. And she, woman behind me where my finger's pointing in the hat. Yeah. Um, and her name, great name, Flossie Gay. Can't beat that. Um, anyway, the, these poems, um, souvenirs of a shrunken world are poems that take place at the 1904 World's Fair, which St. Louis, where I grew up, and it was like St. Louis's shiny. Um, the whole world was on display there, and my grandmother was 19. All of my grandparents, <clears throat> excuse me, attended the fair. Um, and it was this wonderland, as well as a racist nightmare with all of the um, anthropological exhibits of indigenous peoples put on display. Um, and also the beginning of America's heightened imperialism um, overseas, not the manifest destiny, just stay here, um, imperialism. Anyway, this poem imagines my grandmother getting a glimpse of Teddy Roosevelt, who was the president at the time and flipped on the switch for the electricity that kept the fair illuminated for nine months. Um, and I know for a fact that she considered him to be a bully. And I think she called him an imperialist windbag. So <laughs> this is her response to seeing Teddy Roosevelt at the fair. Flossie and T.R. She lingers at station number 12 in a flirtatious hat and a cotton waist starched beyond comfort. Portuguese on her lap, a prop for conversation, like her swan head umbrella. Her assets are few, a talent for blushing, and the convent education of little use to the beau who's been waiting for her at the Tyrolean Alps for nearly an hour. A carriage passes, a flash of light, the glare of a monocle perhaps, or those dazzling teeth. His gaze trains upon her, palpable as he tips at. The color rises in her face, spite banging in her breast as she refuses him a smile. Love that woman. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I, I love the family poems. They're great. Thank you. Thanks. Most of the poems are in someone's voice. They're persona poems. Yeah. Um, and this one is a persona poem by a, um, a recent immigrant who is uh, doing the polling. He's driving his gondolas in the shape of swans through the lagoons. Um, yeah, so it's the height of the immigration through Ellis Island, which means that the immigration, this massive uh, immigration is people from Southeast Europe, which is the beginning of the waspy angst about uh, there are gonna be more of them than us and the replacement theory. Um, so it's kind of a glimpse to seeing all of that contempt for immigrants coming at us early in the 20th century. Swan boat earlier. Embarking, they mouth soft words to the ladies. Lagoon, woozy, wop. Men with eight bits and an hour to kill. I'm supposed to sing as we float along, a quaint air to soothe the nerves of the princes of shoe leather and liver pills, these brewmeisters with old money stuffed into new pockets. They have paved their streets with the bones of our back, scorned our saints and our old country hats. Walking home 
from our Saturday bath, we spit on the gates of their private streets, scowl through the grates at their children who are pale as dolls. And ironically, those private streets, for anybody from St. Louis, Kathy, do you know those like Portland Place and all that in the Central West End that have the gates on them? Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, just last year or year before last, a couple in one of those big mansions there had a fit because people were in a Black Lives Matter parade going by their house and they came out with semi-automatic weapons. Yeah, um, right. It became national news made St. Louis look really stupid. Um, and I think the husband is running for state senator. So let's pray for Missouri, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then the last poem I'm going to read from the fair is the poem that it, the title comes from. Um, miniatures. Souvenirs of a shrunken world. The idea is that the world was reduced to a fairground. Granted, it was the largest World's Fair ever, but you could see the world in this enormous sculpted um, place in St. Louis. And it took three years to build it. It cost, it commemorated the Louisiana Purchase and it cost as much as the Louisiana Purchase. And it was the only World's Fair that made a profit. Um, it took three years to build in two months to level it to the ground, including this Ferris wheel, which they dynamited and charged admission to see it collapse. <laughs> so if that isn't the 20th century coming at you, I don't know what is. So this was very evocative for me to write it. I mean, when you write about then, you're always writing about now because you know what happened. Um, and the last thing I'll say is the reason people wanted souvenirs is because the thing was going to be gone. There will be no trace of it, which is very planned obsolescence and let's charge admission for every piece of it. Take a ride, watch it collapse. <laughs> yeah, full life cycle. Yeah, yeah. And, and to make matters worse, when I was researching the Palace of Industry, no, Palace of Transportation, had the largest locomotive in the world on a turnstile in the middle of it with the light going woo, 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 and it scared the bejesus out of people but they loved seeing it it was so huge and the name of the locomotive was the 20th century so watch out and get out of the way because here it comes okay so here's just this individual again the small the big story through the small story aptly titled Miniatures. I roamed the grounds for days like a Bedouin in the desert, searching for something just right for my wife, stuffing my pockets with buttons, pins, calendars you could lose in a breeze until I tossed them in the rubbish. Each trinket felt smaller than experience, too cheap for the weight of our time apart or the cruel quiet of her confinement. Twelfth birth in 10 years, and who can say if the tiny soul will make it to winter or when she might allow him a name. I would heap the mantle with souvenirs of a shrunken world to amuse her. Gunboats, tiny telephones, geisha girls, but I fear she is beyond diversion. My present hope fits in my hand, a silver plate walnut with a clasp inside it a fan of vistas reduced to a bearable size. So Holly, let me ask you this, you know, as you're, as you're writing, uh, do you kind of questions come into your work? I, I'm just wondering sometimes if, if, you know, like you may be thinking of certain stylistic elements and then people just kind of write as they write. I'm just wondering, do you? Do you mean is, do I pose questions like David White? Yeah, li yeah, um, like yeah, like you. Do those? I rarely put questions in there. Yeah. Certainly, questioning. So this was the first 
World's Fair that regular people had cameras. Yeah. There's a bazillion photographs of this fair. And not only are poems persona poems, speaking in someone else's voice, many yeah. of them are ekphrastic. So I would get a, a, a photo and just meditate on it until I could hear a voice. Wow. Trying to say what was going on. Um, but no, I, the question stylistically, I mean, I write, I write prose poems. They're chunks. They're not pretty. They're, they look like press yeah. releases. Um, yeah, no, I'm just asking, uh, you know, I think some people are, you know, want to put specific things in poems. I, I'm just, I'm just, I was right. just asking like that. Pose so. a question. Yeah, I, I love poems that pose interesting questions. I think mine raise questions as opposed to pose them. Yeah. No, I think that one about planned obsolescence and you know, three years to build and two months to take down. No, they're just some great images. Phenomenal, phenomenal um, occurrence, you know, and very shortly after that, you know, it was about the white race being the dominant race of the world. And most of the indigenous people were in huts on the ground. And um, my paternal grandparents as Germans were considered the height of European civilization, like three weeks later when World War I happened. And then they were the devils of the universe. So if you buy into a hierarchy, you better watch your back because eventually it's gonna be your turn. And I think that, that I'm very much looking at that in all of these poems, like point of view, like who's judging who? Hmm. Because the fair was designed to feel like you are the master of all you survey. Wow. And you're not, <laughs> it's like you're, you, one day you're gonna be on the floor in somebody's hut and they're gonna be checking you out too, so relax. <laughs> I mean, within 15 years of the fair, all of the names of the streets in St. Louis that had German eminences were gone. They stopped teaching it in school. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. A tragedy waiting to happen when you do a hierarchy of hierarchy of things, which is a segue to a poem to the Cold War called well. Hierarchy of Fruit. This is about being a Cold War kid a Catholic Cold War kid and being an adolescent and the things that people were trying to tell you about what was expected of girls and what was expected of civilized people. <laughs> and it's the hierarchy of fruits because, well, you'll see, it's about being encouraged to eat apples. I guess they were scared of bananas or something. Anyway, the hierarchy of fruits. We learned of apples, of firm flesh and uniform color, we diagrammed the passive voice, sang Gregorian chants, and charted our personal hygiene habits as an exercise in science because there were no monkeys in space yet. We watched film strips and pondered limbo and the fate of the poor pagans, those grinning naked people who ate mites for breakfast, did not know God. But surely they got the better deal, dancing and climbing trees and eating with their hands, while we had to sit at metal desks decked out in plaid and guarded like grenades with faulty pins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Did you get any of that stuff when you were in school? Yeah, I went to, uh, yeah, I went to Catholic school for the first five years, so. Uh, the, I, I used to wear wool pants every day. And basically I tried not to bend my knees. I walked like a robot because the wool, wool back then was like, it was like, it was like barbed wire and we had to wear a jacket and tie. So oh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember really anything about my education <laughs> from one to five. All I remember is uh, I had to eat. I don't know. We had, a, we had a very, <laughs> I guess, traditional food at home. So there was like, I remember trying, someone said, we have to eat this hash at school. I'm like, what is that stuff? What is hash? 
I have no idea what that is. Okay, I'll pass on that. Let's go back to the bread and butter part. That's funny. The hash. That's funny. So you don't remember praying for pagan babies? No, no, no. No, nah, I no, we used to have uh Maureen does remember. Yeah, first Friday, you know, there was a mass upstairs, everyone attended. It was a it was a boys obviously a boys school. So uh yeah, yeah. All I remember is Palmer penmanship. Oh, if you yeah. Writing outside the lines, you were subject to see this ruler. Uh oh. Yeah. 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 You were, yeah. There was, no, I just remember Palmer penmanship, wool pants, and hash. I don't mm. know. There's, there's too many images okay. there, but it was like, yeah, it was, it was a, a weird time in the, so what was I? I must have been from 56 to, 61 or something 1956 to 61 that's you know it's like a weird it was like a weird time that's uh, your poor. um I, I have an optimistic poem about that era of the fair of my grandparents um it really was a time of optimism for them it was they were they were right on the cusp of moving from rural illinois to st louis the country itself was booming population. Um, it was the beginning of the great migration from the South to the North. And it was also like the switch from agriculture to industry in the United States. And so everything was possible. And this is my, um, my dad's parents, Rudy and Dode. And I love this because they were true. Um, They're just sweethearts. They were sweethearts. She would say, oh, honey, he's so confectionary. Like, how adorable is that? You know, it's like, anyway. Rudy and the science of appetite. There is nothing we cannot do. Learn. Excuse me, let me start again. There is nothing we cannot learn, dear. Nothing we cannot do. For the world is our plaything, an oyster, a horse painted blue. A sea of white, be a sea of wheat behind us now, drays along the road, boys in a hired buggy behind the grange. The swing still hanging in the orchard where once my hands caught, then pushed, caught, then pushed the small of your back till your shoes reach the sky and the cottonwood side for love of you. Oh, so sweetie, <laughs> sweeties. Cottonwoods, Maureen. Cottonwoods, yeah. I, I'm ready. If anybody wants to jump in, please just go. Holly, yeah, we stop. should. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm. Uh, That's right. Yeah, I'm That's too right. enamored with the, uh, uh, you know, the first, my first poetry immersion since uh, the end of June. So, uh, yeah, we should. We we do You're take. Yeah, I'm warming up. Yeah. Uh, no, we do want to take time for uh, people uh, in the audience to ask you some questions and then we'll get back to the the historical part of our program. I look, at, look at the Holly's going, oh boy, where's my history book? So does anybody have any questions? questions? No, I'll just keep going. But yeah. Anybody have any questions for Holly? Uh, Carolina? I have a, I have a, yeah, I have a question. You know me, I always have questions. I know, um, leave it to the school teacher also. You know how to do the classroom management. I appreciate that. So you said, can you ever go home, right? That was one of the, I was, I jotted down some of those questions that you always, um, you know, you said that you, you are always posing to yourself. So I yeah. wonder, have you ever thought of well, what constitutes home? What is, that's one of my questions that I, um, exactly. So I, as an I think because I think because I cannot go home, right? Because of my own experience, that I work on that. What what is home? So I wonder if that's something that's part of your inquiry, or have you written poems about that, or whatever? I haven't, and I think it's like, you know, for you, in a different way, coming from Cuba and then going to Puerto Rico and then coming here and coming from a place you can't go back to, um, 
I left a really stable place where people, I'm the only person in my family who moved. Um, so we would always win the $2 bill prize at the family reunion for coming the furthest. I mean, all you had to do was move 50 miles away, get $2. But I, in leaving, um, marrying an child, also a Cuban refugee, um, in some ways became an exile myself. Um, living in an exile community, I have found over the course of my life that my, the, they'd never say it, but the Cuban family feels I'm too American and the American family feels I'm too Latina. And the same with my kids, you know, if you're a bridge family and I'm not in any way saying I'm a political exile like you are, but as a cultural exile, for example, if anything comes up along those lines of being, I don't know, not a blonde kid from St. Louis, um, and I say something like, it has happened several times with others, someone has said, oh, I don't think of your kids as Latinos. Why not? And he goes, well, they're, they're not Latinos. I'm like, how are they not Latinos? Because they're Americans. I said, they are Latinos who are Americans. They're Americans who are Latinos. You know, it's like, we can do several things at the same time. But you tend to think so monolithically, you're either this or that, you know, and it, that applies to any number of ways of identity. But for me, home, Carolina, has always been where my kids are. Mm -hmm. And so probably the worst exile for me was the 20 years I spent not in the same city where they were. And the reason that I moved back here which is not the easiest or most affordable place to live as I bellyache about all the time. Um, you know, everybody's like, you moved from Asheville? What? My kids are here. My grandkids are here. And so that's the best. That's all I've ever known since I was 23 years old of home. So that, thank you for asking that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I always say, don't let the poet off the hook. Karen, this is your chance. You know, Ooh, get get, 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 a, get a shot across the bow. God, I got. I'm such a fangirl. I don't have any shots. But um, Holly, <laughs> Thank no, you. I'm not kidding you. Like, I am obsessing over this book. I love it so much. Um, could oh, you thanks. just talk about your process? Like, do you have a writing process or is it random or just what have you got going on? What are you doing? Well, I'm a lay bloomer. And so my writing process is I didn't really get to be serious about it until I was in my 40s. And I thought I was going to be writing creative nonfiction. And then it and then I found out what prose poems were. It's like. And so writing prose poems and most of my prose poems are about 200 words long and I realized that that's how long you get when you're a mother with toddlers that's how long it takes for a nap mm -hmm. I can't any longer than that it's always be 250 words so being with my poetry group has helped me a lot with the prompts that we have and the collaborative do get myself out of some of that um, that book in particular, um, it has three sections. My first book, or my second book had three sections, which is very like Catholic school. It's nostalgia, menace, and confession. And the one you have is the sleeping things. The first section is being the Cold War Catholic kid, which the Cold War was great for any kid with a rabid imagination. I mean, I'm gonna save the host and the Russian jack booted thugs will kill me and I'll be a martyr and go straight to heaven. You know, it was great. It was very, you know, that mind is nuts when they kind of feed you kind of nuts mm -hmm. information. Yeah. And then the second section is about being a Midwesterner in Miami and you may think you know Spanish, but until you've been eating that horse for a while, you don't really know what the words mean mm -hmm. because you don't know culture. 
And so that middle section is about, there's even a poem in there in English and Spanish that my question was, can you ever make English and Spanish rhyme? And it's pretty awkward. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Not so much. laughs> and then the last section is about, you know, becoming um, older and looking back and um, that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a poem about from that section, which is actually about my son, when he turned 40, wanted to go to Spain because he was really jealous because his sister was born in Spain mm -hmm. in elementary. I was born in Europe. Like, don't tell him it was fascist Spain. Just say Europe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we went there as hippies protesting the war. And my dad's like, so you're going to a fascist country? Clear that up for me. It's no sense. I was like, mm, they speak Spanish there. I married a Spanish speaker. Anyhow, so the poem is me being in Spain with my grandkids and my son and daughter-in-law and the kids saying their Spanish is so weird here. And I'm like, it's the Spanish. Your Spanish is weird. This is the Spanish. Anyway, and then sitting and having coffee and listening, just listening to that Spanish accent. Carolina, you know this from how much we love looking at all those Spanish things on Netflix. It's so fun to listen to that accent, but the the scene is being in a plaza drinking coffee and listening and just letting that wash over me. Mm. And then I open my eyes and I saw myself sitting across the plaza as a young person. Awesome. And so this is my picture of her. So can I read that? Yeah, Since absolutely. you kind of gave me a great absolutely. setup. Thank you. Um, it's called Plaza San Miguel. And it was also in an anthology about poets who love Bob Dylan. Okay, the Plaza San Miguel. Across the way, my past sips coffee. Her cup, like mine, is steaming. She is dressed like the girl in Dylan's song, who never stumbles, who's got no place to fall. And I'm playing the lady in a camel hair coat and red pashmina that would have made my mother proud. We sit silent as the Spanish of Spaniards fills the square as she jots in a notebook, taking down a beggar's plea, the whisper of lovers. Oh, I wish she would look up and see me, but there's no comforting her now, far from home, convinced that exile is an act of will, something to hone the dull contours of youth. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And here's one that ties that with my mom and the generational divide. Um, it's called, oh, it's in Sleeping Things. It's called Mold. And it's telling the, the generational conflict through, well, Jello. <laughs> Gelatin mold. Newly wed, twirled around the kitchen in Bermuda shorts and white flats. A sick smoking on the windowsill above the toaster as she made scalloped potatoes and pork chops and Jello with Dream Whip topping. But in the years of aerosol cheese and cocktail wieners, she lost me. I turned to the raw and fiber, hungry for hearty grains and root vegetables and a language she didn't speak. It's true, I fled, leaving her to the rib and the aspects quivering in silence on the kitchen table. We gotta leave the jello behind. Walk away from the jello. <laughs> Walk away from the jello. So you said you're going from old to new. Are, are there some new things in your soon to be published chapbook you wanna share? Oh, our collaborative one? I'm, well, I'm I thought you said you just 
publish something. No, we just sent it out. Oh, you just we sent just it out. We finished making it. We we shaped it. But yeah. no, it's not it's not published yet. It's not 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 matriculated yet. Not yet, but it will be. It will be. Um, I I learned on two. One is brand new and probably pretty awkward, but I kind of love it. Um, and it's well, as you can see, it's awkward and scribbled on and all that. This is me, and then this is the poet de Prima. So it's like this column as well, I'm responding to her. And she wrote a book called Revolutionary Poems that really helped me look back on those years of flying away from the gelatin mold. So I'll put my hand, my fingers up when I'm reading her, her work. Yeah, and it's yeah, from, I yeah. think there's a hundred of them. Last year was the 50th anniversary of the of them. Um, and the title is Critical Rage Theory. And AJ, AJ is my grandson. Let me fix this. Okay. AJ will vote for the first time this year, but weary of the rancor and the marketplace called the real world, he can't see the point. I search for something to brace him and reach for Deprima's revolutionary letters. It will take all of us shoving at the thing from all sides down. Missives from another time, another world, but present still. Hymns from the humming hive of youth, a compendium of fire and innocence, of a fevered idealism that became so easy to mock, to co-opt, and to use against us in later years. Let no one work for another except for love, and what you make above your needs be given to the tribe a common wealth. The muscle of the book lifts me, carries me back, braids under bandanas, overalls of Jesus sandals and gnarly beards, a mass of us sitting in Audubon Park, teeming like a planet, green, solid, earnest. I have no other ransom money, nothing to break or barter, but my life. Together, we were sure of ourselves, sure inside the gathered mass of us. Store water, store food, hoard matches. Think about these things. The day will come when we will have to know the answers. For a long while, we lived on 20 pound sacks of beans and rice and boundless and reckless hope. Endless as the sea, not separate, we die a million times a day. We are born a million times, each breath, life and death. But after that, the marketplace had its way with us. But anthems survive. America has not even begun yet. This continent is seed. The anthem intact, fodder for the next generation and the next and the next. Get up, put on your shoes, get started. Someone will finish it. Mm. Isn't she something? Yeah. Isn't she something? Yeah, very nice, very nice, very different, very nice. Yeah, I get so angry. There was a clue in the New York Times crossword puzzle this morning that the answer was hippy dippy. I almost had a fit. You know how like hippies became a joke, like within five minutes, <laughs> completely forgetting like the idealism and the political activism and change of values. It's like, oh yeah, that was that <clears throat> grass smoking weatherman, George Carlin, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so I think I'm going to finish with this one, and then if you have any other questions, yeah, or yeah, whatever. Um, this one, uh, the title is a tribute to that other Missouri guy, Mark Twain, Innocence Abroad, and the the uh, epigraph is by Wendell Berry. Forgive me for writing you in pencil. I no longer have the courage to write if I can't erase. 
Europe forced me to write smaller than ever, smaller than when I tried to squeeze my surname into a little box on a form, smaller than when I transcribed dialogue as it was spoken in a second class car, window seat, all the ashtrays full. Europe taught me to tuck the notebook into my pocket and to look straight ahead when police boarded the train at Bratislava or Burgos. Europe showed me how to use pencil instead of pen, a four inch stub with soft lead for writing aerograms, poems on index cards, sketches on the back of receipts, all tossed into a string bag from which any of these small, small things might escape and float down a narrow street and into the gutter. Surely that's what they meant when they said Europe was charming. Instead, it was more haunted than charming no way to find a cafe without passing empty lots where cathedrals once stood, rail platforms where people have been crammed into cattle cars, docks from which famished ancestors had departed. No, a pen would not do. Ink so permanent, ink a stain we could not bear, so young, so young. Hmm. Nice, very nice. So you grew up in St. Louis. How did your kids, because you live in Miami now, right? Yeah. So how did your kids migrate to Miami? How did they end up there? Well, because it's where Cubans live. <laughs> if they're not that? <laughs> and their dad's Cuban. So, I mean, we never, we lived in St. Louis for one year. Yeah. In their childhood, but we lived in Miami. Oh, so you lived there for, yeah. Your kids grew up there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we were away probably nine years. I've lived in 30 cities since I graduated college. And my kids yeah. lived in 27. So Yeah. Yeah, nice. Well, as the saying goes, marry someone unstable and see the world. <laughs> marry someone unstable and see the world. And uh, another That's book nice. title. Another book title coming here. It's coming. I love it. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, man. my kids grew up here and they kind of had to lose. We lived in Wilmington for a while. So when we moved here, they were like, oh, mom, I'm just being with eel. And then within like a month, they're saying, can Susie come over? And it's like, wow, they're like sponges. They just, they're little. They're just going to pick up wherever they are. So yeah. they're incredibly adept at social yeah. situations and languages. Yeah. So does anybody have any final questions for Holly? <clears throat> very quiet crowd today. Well, yeah, very attentive. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was going to say. And uh, Teresa and Perry, I'll get back to you with dates for your reading. I didn't forget about you. Oh, so, and uh, Maria, I got to look at your email. I think you wanted to read also. So, um, you know, we're still trying to fill out the calendar for, uh, I think we've got about, by the end of today, I think we'll have 13 of the 40 weeks filled, something like that. So, yeah. Well, we'll yeah. be writing for one for the- um... Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. We got a, uh, I need uh, Caroline alive with the crew. <laughs> yeah, our group is called Tres Abuelas y Una Mama. Three grandmas and a mom. Yeah, so last year we had four women, and uh, then another show we had five women. So it was really. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Angela Dribben and her Virginia crew. Yeah, no, it's great. I think part of it is, you know, the conversation interactions that you have as a group are just fantastic to listen to. And, yeah. and obviously the poetry you create. So may I ask a question? Yeah. Thank you. Holly, that was absolutely beautiful. I'm oh, just so happy you. that I was here. And um, John, thank you so much. What a great, great, great event. Um, yeah. I'll probably be asking you this question in private, but I was like, I have to ask it. Okay. Um, <laughs> how do you hold all of this? Like, what, what is it about you that as a poet and a woman, and a mom, I'm gonna start crying, sorry, I love you. Um, <laughs> I think then, you and I know this together, I, about holding a lot. 
How do you do it? Um, I'm a really sturdy person. I mean, one of the things I've learned through, you know, surviving any number of things is that resilience comes out of having had a lot poured into you. I had a lot poured into me as a, as a child, as a teenager, I continue to receive it from my family and friends. I'm, I'm very um, full of strength and sturdiness because of that. And I also think that having jumped off the end of the limb as a very person made me really more daring than I would have been if I'd Esther Groves, for example, um, and that builds on itself. You know, if you have to walk into a meat market and ask for pork chops and don't even know how to say it, it, it builds, you, you know, you get stronger. I think well, you're has struggling with learning Spanish and I think Beth has, you know, worked on it and learning a language is so hard and humiliating when it's on the street and you can't say, help me, I think I'm falling or my water just broke, any number of things, you know, that, but you do it, you know, you just do it because you have no choice. And I put myself in a lot of situations where I had no choice. So I think that's how, and you know, what you're ex explaining, I think it often comes out in my poems, this idea of, trauma is not always violent. It's excess of experience. It's not possible. It's not bearable. It's too much. And so I always return to the little thing, that stone in the pocket, you know, the things you do to soothe yourself. Oh, that's right. My grandmother had to do that. Oh, that's right. My daughter's confused. All those talismans of what makes it bearable. Yeah. Holly, I enjoyed your work very much. Did you hear me, Holly? I enjoyed yeah. your work very much. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thank uh, I'm gonna, you I'm gonna take, much. I'm gonna take the line on oh, my past sit sipping coffee and go with that. Okay. You said that earlier. And John, thank you for all the traumatic uh, uh, ideas or memories on the uh, Palmer method because that was <laughs> that. Now you got me going. Yeah, yeah. Well, Carolina, I've got to produce a poem for Carolina probably in the next like five hours or something. So, <clears throat> well, try uh, the try the Palmer method left-handed. Yeah, left yeah. Listen, I've been trouble writing oh. right-handed. Forget about left-handed. Well, left-handed. You know, think about it. In those days, right? You can't do the right circles because you only had right-handed desks. Yeah. So how do you do the right circles? You ever think of that? So it was. Well, the thing traumatic. is. Palmer penmanship, Palmer penmanship, you need the paper that has a little line in the middle because your lower vowels cannot extend above the middle line. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. That was another That was another penalty. But how do you lean like this on a right-handed desk when you're left-handed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Do, the, do the circles that way. Well, you, you were supposed to get out of your chair and write backwards. Well, yeah, right backwards, yeah. And then you get scolded or hit. Or yeah, then, then, then the ruler would come out to smack you for getting out of your chair. Yeah. There you go. There you go. I, I just have... helped a girl with a college essay who her her essay was about the challenges of being left-handed and this she had about how hard it is to tell your own story. It's a beautiful essay and it's all because of left. Yeah. So well, you know, it's gotten much better, but think about all the things that have changed. It was a right-handed world in our day. Right hand, how do you open a can with a right-handed can opener? I mean, it just went down the line. It was horrible. Well, I think they're trying to convert you, as Maria said, to a right-handed person. And well, 